Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Dwayne Breger. I'm with, with the uh, Massachusetts Department of Energy Resources and uh, greatly appreciate everybody's interest and participation in our Massachusetts Renewable Thermal Webinar. I'm here with uh, my colleagues, uh, a few of my colleagues from DOER, as well as uh, colleagues from the uh, Massachusetts Clean Energy Center, as well as um, uh, um, uh, consultants who worked on this uh, project uh, from Meister Consulting. <clears throat> Let me uh, start off with uh, providing you with the, the uh, agenda for the, uh, for the webinar. Again, uh, I'm Dwayne Breger, and I will provide a quick overview of the uh, policy development and the history and the context of uh, this Commonwealth's interest in uh, moving forward uh, with renewable thermal uh, um, <clears throat> market development. Uh, I will then turn it over to Neil Vea uh, from Meister Consulting Group, uh, Neil uh, and his team from Meister. Uh, were uh, commissioned by DOER and the Clean Energy Center to uh, do a Renewable Heating and Cooling Opportunities and Impacts Report, and Neil will provide an overview of, the, uh, of that study and its results. And then uh, finally, we'll turn it over to uh, Christy Howe from the Clean Energy Center, and she will uh, um, provide information and introduce uh, the work that uh, DOER and CEC will be uh, embarking on shortly. Uh, with, with regard to a renewable thermal pilot program uh, to complement actually the uh, existing pilot program in solar water heating. Okay, so um, as, uh, as background in terms of the uh, importance and interest of uh, the Commonwealth with regard to uh, looking very carefully now at thermal energy use uh, across the Commonwealth, uh, this graph gives a, gives a, um, a, a, a picture of uh, primary energy consumption across the nation, uh, the U.S. that is, uh, noting that uh, despite the fact that there's been a great deal of policy efforts both at the federal level and at many, many state levels on uh, transportation fuels as well as electricity, uh, it is the case that uh, you know, at least a, about a third of our energy uh, consumption in the United States is for thermal uh, energy use. Um, and so it is an, a, a critically important part of our energy consumption uh, and, and uh, hence uh, and, and therefore also with regard to uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, of that thermal energy use, uh, a good chunk of that is uh, consumed in the industrial uh, sector, uh, but a significant amount also in residential and commercial. Yeah, that'd be helpful. As I noted before, um, there's been a, a widespread interest across the nation uh, at the state levels with regard to uh, energy policies uh, focused on renewable energy policies focused on the electricity sector. And these have primarily manifest themselves in the form of uh, renewable portfolio standard uh, programs. Uh, at late, latest count, uh, uh, 30 state, uh, 29 states and D.C., uh, as well as Puerto Rico, have adopted uh, <clears throat> some form of an RPS program. And uh, these vary in various uh, different ways, but primarily they address uh, uh, issues strictly with regard to the electricity sector. Uh, there are uh, I sh uh, we should note, and they're denoted in this uh, in this chart. There are a few states uh, that are also have have uh, included solar water heating in uh, in their RPS uh, policies. But for the most part, these are policies that are focused strictly on the electricity sector. <clears throat> now, this makes somewhat sense because um, over the history of policymaking in in the, the in energy, the electric sector has always been a much more highly regulated sector uh, than thermal energy and hence it's been rel relatively easy um, uh, to uh, put together policies that address an already regulated marketplace. Uh, but um, go to the next slide. Um, what uh, uh, Massachusetts uh, and the Commonwealth is interested in, in uh, really is, is uh, going beyond uh, our uh, clean energy uh, policies uh, with regard to uh, building efficiencies and, and renewable electricity and really moving this forward into, the, uh, into an integrated policy uh, for renewable thermal technologies. These would be certainly inclusive of solar water heating, but also creating more of a, of a um, broad and, and sort of level playing field across thermal tech, uh, renewable thermal technologies, 
as denoted here at least as uh, as wood chips, as solar thermal, solar thermal uh, biofuels, or at least advanced biofuels, and uh, and geothermal uh, geothermal uh, energy. The importance, uh, the, uh, the renewable thermal will provide important benefits to the Commonwealth and to uh, households in the Commonwealth. Uh, keep in mind that uh, at a household level, uh, a good one-third of our uh, energy expenditures at the household level is for uh, thermal energy, space heating, as well as, uh, as water heating. Uh, renewable thermal benefits to the extent that, for the most part, um, these thermal expenditures by our households are for oil, natural gas, um, all of which, uh, propane to some extent, all of which are imported into the Commonwealth. Uh, there is tremendous opportunities for maintaining some of that energy expenditure into the local economy, uh, creating economic growth, uh, creating job creation uh, within uh, the region. Uh, importantly, reducing our greenhouse gas emissions associated with uh, fossil fuels uh, that dominates the uh, thermal energy space, uh, as well as improving our energy security. Massachusetts is, is, is not alone here. There's uh, actually some uh, growing uh, efforts and interest in uh, both uh, federal and state uh, renewable heating policy development. At the federal level, we see the uh, Renewable Energy Alternative Production Act uh, is uh, looking at a PTC for non-electric renewable energy. Uh, solar water heating is certainly inclu is included in the federal RPS uh, proposal. Uh, biomass uh, stoves uh, get a, a, tax re a tax credit from the federal government. In addition, we do see uh, uh, more states looking at this as well. Uh, most notably uh, uh, for our region is uh, New Hampshire, which uh, recently uh, did uh, come out with a, a carve-out uh, from their RPS program uh, for uh, renewable thermal technologies uh, that is to, uh, uh, slated to begin uh, at the beginning of, uh, of next year. Uh, but in addition to that, there's a, a number of other states across the U.S. Uh, that have been uh, considering and to some extent uh, put into place uh, renewable thermal uh, programs in their RPS. Again, in these other states, it's uh, more dominated on the solar water heating uh, side. Uh, in addition, Hawaii, uh, certainly with very high energy costs and all imported fuel, uh, has some uh, very uh, aggressive uh, solar heating mandates. And, uh, and Minnesota, as well as the leader in developing uh, policy and legislation uh, for uh, the, uh, utilities to offer rebates for renewable heating. Uh, we've also looked uh, very closely abroad as well, particularly uh, in the European approaches to renewable thermal, uh, noting that uh, for the most part they have taken a um, leadership role in, in a lot of the uh, technology and industry development, uh, particularly in, uh, in the biomass, uh, uh, biomass uh, pellets and biomass chip technology, but also with regard to uh, some of the advanced and uh, larger scale solar thermal uh, uh, technologies and installations. Uh, in the, at the EU uh, level as a whole, uh, renewable thermal is part of the targets and, and uh, links to uh, building energy performance into their climate change, um, uh, their uh, greenhouse gas reduction commitments. Uh, notably in, uh, in the EU are Germany, the UK, and Austria, uh, each of which have uh, different approaches, but ones that we are um, looking at carefully. Um, uh, uh, in, 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 those different, uh, in those different countries. Uh, most no notably, Germany uh, has um, uh, um, integrated framework for targets and grants for uh, renewable thermal. The UK has a very uh, aggressive and interesting um, uh, program with regard to uh, that they, it's called the Renewable Heating in this Incentive, which provides a production-based um, incentive for uh, uh, thermal energy uh, from renewables, requiring uh, substantial metering and so forth. And so they've been moving forward uh, quite a bit on not just the uh, policy, but also the implementation of that policy with uh, proper metering and so forth. And Austria, and particularly the, the uh, state of Upper Austria within Austria, has been a, um, a, a real leader uh, both in solar water heating uh, as well as um, uh, the biomass, tech, uh, biomass heating technologies. Uh, both in terms of uh, economic uh, and industry development, as well as uh, policy incentives and policy approaches to move those markets strategically forward. 
Looking uh, more specifically at, uh, at, at the context within Massachusetts, uh, there's a number of, uh, of different uh, policies and programs uh, that have been sort of coming together uh, to make this a timely uh, uh, opportunity for not only uh, the state agencies and the Clean Energy Center, but also for the Commonwealth as a whole. As uh, many folks know, uh, 2008 we passed the um, uh, Global Warming Solutions Act, which commits the Commonwealth uh, to substantial greenhouse gas uh, reductions with a, a substantial target of 25 percent uh, reductions by 2020 and a more significant uh, commitment uh, of 80 percent uh, by 2050 uh, reductions. Uh, coming out of that Green, uh, Global Warming Solutions Act was the Massachusetts Clean Energy and Climate Plan, uh, basically that lays out the uh, policies and approaches uh, 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 by which the Commonwealth will get to the 2020 reduction targets. And notably within that climate plan was a, uh, a, a specification uh, for renewable thermal technologies uh, to uh, play its share in uh, reducing those greenhouse gas uh, emissions uh, the, uh, of, of, of uh, accounting for about 2 million tons of greenhouse gas emission reductions. Um, in addition, uh, uh, our agency, along with the Clean Energy Center, commissioned uh, to start this effort off, commissioned a renewable heating and cooling market analysis uh, in April 2012. This is, in fact, the uh, analysis that uh, Neil, that was commissioned to Meister Consulting Group, and Neil will uh, discuss and bring forward in, in a moment. Uh, importantly also, and, and just recently, the uh, energy bill that uh, recently passed the legislature and was signed by the governor uh, just uh, at the end of last month um, was the, a direction uh, from the legislature for DOER uh, to study uh, the integration of renewable thermal into our existing uh, alternative energy portfolio standard. Um, <clears throat> lastly, in terms of uh, my slides to uh, provide the uh, context, uh, we do also have a number of uh, incentive programs uh, to begin uh, this uh, economic development and market development in Massachusetts. Notably, uh, the Clean Energy Center, and, and uh, 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 Christy will be uh, discussing this uh, later in the webinar, uh, has uh, developed a Commonwealth solar water heating uh, program. Uh, in addition, uh, DOER uh, expended a fair amount of uh, ARA, uh, federal stimulus funds, uh, some of which were on biomass thermal pilots, a number of different pilots around the Commonwealth, as well as one important uh, 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 grant that was provided competitively to Sandry Energy Company in Greenfield, which basically transformed uh, that business, which was historically a, a, an oil-based energy company uh, serving a large, uh, large region in, in western Massachusetts and surrounding states, and transformed themselves basically into a full-service uh, energy company including energy efficiency services, solar water heating, uh, biomass uh, wood pellets, uh, as well as bulk delivery of, of, uh, of wood pellets. Uh, importantly, we've also uh, have dedicated uh, some funds from that have come in through the RPS program, uh, the different RPS uh, classes uh, uh, that come in to the Commonwealth as alternative compliance payments for any shortages of, uh, of RECs or um, uh, different class recs that are in the in the market, and um, we've dedicated a, a, a number of these uh, these these funds to certain programs to begin uh, uh, developing projects and uh, opportunities for renewable thermal. Uh, most importantly, uh, most notably, we have a uh, renewable thermal and cogeneration uh, program with the Department of Housing and Com uh, and Community Development um, uh, for public housing. Uh, we have. Uh, the renewable thermal pilot programs, which CEC will be kicking off and Christy will be talking about later in this webinar. And importantly, we also have additional funds uh, that are going to be allocated uh, specifically for thermal business investment financing to help businesses uh, not so much to invest in projects, but to invest in infrastructure to bring that technology and those businesses forward in Massachusetts. Uh, lastly, I'll also mention that DOER was awarded recently a, uh, an award, a competitive award from the Department of Energy uh, in which we will be looking at uh, providing 
renewable thermal uh, retrofits uh, to public housing and to uh, schools across the Commonwealth. So with that background, if we can go to the next slide. With that background, uh, we'll pass it on to uh, uh, Neil Vea from Meister Consulting Group, who will take us through the um, uh, Renewable Heating and Cooling Opportunities and Impacts Report. Great. Uh, thanks, Dwayne. Um, we're really pleased to be here and uh, have enjoyed working with uh, MassDOER and CEC uh, on this study. Um, as far as we know, this is uh, the first in the nation integrated assessment of renewable heating and cooling technologies. Uh, and this study actually co covered uh, solar thermal, uh, biomass thermal uh, heat pumps, including air source heat pumps and ground source heat pumps, as well as biodiesel. Um, I should point out there was a, a highly collaborative effort uh, between DOER, Mass CEC, um, ourselves, MCG, as well as a number of uh, renewable thermal professional and business associations. Uh, in particular, the Biomass Thermal Energy Council, uh, the New England Geothermal Professional Association, the Massachusetts Oil Heat Council, and the Solar Energy Business Association of New England all provided really helpful input um, and expertise uh, from leading industry players as we developed this study. I would additionally note that um, sort of all of the inputs uh, for the study uh, were reviewed by industry, but we also did an extensive literature review and uh, worked with uh, regional policymakers uh, to validate uh, the inputs into the study um, in order to try to get a, a, a good faith estimate of what the costs and the greenhouse gas emission reductions and the potential for renewable thermal technologies are in Massachusetts. Um, so ultimately, the, the study covered uh, the current market status and the, and the supply chain in Massachusetts and regionally, as was appropriate. Uh, we got a fairly good sense of what the major market barriers are, as well as the potential for overcoming those barriers. And then we did a simple analysis uh, looking through uh, the economics, uh, the greenhouse gas emission reduction, and job creation potential of each one of these technologies. Um, so to sort of kick it off, we'll walk through some of our methodology on this study. And ultimately, what we did is create a number of scenarios looking at each uh, uh, renewable thermal technology. Um, I'd just like to point out up front that uh, because of the unique application or context of each one of these technologies, these scenarios weren't designed to create an apples-to-apples -apples comparison between technologies. Uh, but as we'll talk about later, more just to get a, a good sense of what the uh, life cycle uh, costs or savings of each technology was, as well as the greenhouse gas emission reductions. And so our approach was really to develop a residential uh, scenario and a commercial scenario. On the residential side, uh, we decided that a, a typical system at about 13 kilowatts thermal, um, which is roughly equivalent to what a, a 2,000 square foot uh, family home would require. And on the commercial side, uh, we size systems to about 9 to 7 kilowatts thermal, which would work in, say, a 15,000 square foot uh, multifamily building. Um, for each one, we looked at what the potential applications were. So in some cases, that was just for domestic hot water production uh, and space heating. Another, another sense, uh, another scenario is it was for uh, space heating. Um, when we looked at ground source heat pumps as well, we, we considered uh, the cooling load uh, on the commercial side. Um, and so ultimately, we came out with a, a number of scenarios that are detailed in this chart. And, uh, just keep in mind the abbreviations on the left-hand side. Um, so GSHP stands for ground source heat pump. Uh, and in parentheses, you can see what fuel we're looking at offsetting. Uh, here is uh, electric uh, heating as well as cooling. Um, further down the list, you can see pellets. We looked at uh, a wood pellet fueled system for, for biomass that was offsetting electric. Elsewhere, offsetting fuel, oil, or natural gas. Um, the last thing I'd like to note as well is that um, we did apply the incentives that were available uh, on the economic analysis for each one of these technologies. And again, these, these technologies receive a, a diversity of incentives, right? So for example, solar hot water is eligible for the uh, investment tax credit, the federal investment tax credit, which offsets about 30% of the upfront cost, as well as uh, rebates at the state level. Um, however, biomass heating uh, wood pellets um, is not eligible for either of those incentives. 
Um, and one final part of the remark before we move on is that this was for uh, central heating and cooling systems only, right? So we weren't looking at uh, room heating systems. So that rules out a number of technologies like, um, like wood pellet stoves. At any rate, if we look at the, the next slide, um, what we're ultimately driving at was to get a sense of what the life cycle costs or savings, as well as the e greenhouse gas emission reduction potential for a typical insulation in Massachusetts would look like. And this is what this chart summarizes on the residential side. Now along the x-axis you can see the abbreviations for the technologies. Um, and the big wide bars in, in outlined in blue represents the greenhouse gas emission reductions. That corresponds to the right side of the uh, y-axis. Um, the bars in green uh, represent the incremental life cycle cost or savings. So a negative value actually represents savings, and that corresponds to the left-hand side of the y-axis. So as an example, if you look at the very first bar, uh, ground source heat pumps offsetting uh, electric heating system in the residential side, um, they would offset over 300 tons of uh, greenhouse gas emissions um, and provide uh, a net savings of about $31,000. Um, and so as a result, you can see a couple of trends emerging here, um, which I really want to point out here. And that's if, if you're offsetting electric or fuel oil heating systems, um, then you tend to see both greenhouse gas emission reductions as well as life cycle cost savings. Um, so it makes a really good argument for offsetting those fuel types. When you look at natural gas, uh, you still do achieve greenhouse gas reductions to a lesser extent, um, but generally it comes at a, uh, an incremental life cycle cost uh, to the customer. And this is actually a trend we sort of saw commonly throughout uh, the entire assessment, both on the residential and commercial side. Uh, if we look at the, the next slide, um, this shows our commercial results. So again, you see these, these common trends uh, throughout. Um, it's a very compelling case when you're offsetting electric or fuel oil, uh, 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 fossil fuel systems. Less compelling, but not, not terrible if you're offsetting natural gas. Just generally comes uh, with current incentives at a uh, life cycle cost to the customer. So the takeaway here really, I think, was that renewable heating and cooling technologies do offer Massachusetts businesses and residents a cost-effective means to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and fossil fuel dependency. And I think as we sort of evolved more in the report, there's even considerable potential to do more. Um, so let's just take a, a closer look. On the next slide, you can see uh, some of the results uh, at a more granular level uh, for uh, biomass heating systems. And I just want to walk through this as a case study of a similar methodology we took on uh, each one of these technologies and some of the potential that uh, is revealed here for, for biomass heating systems. Now as we go through this, just keep in mind uh, one thing I think is very important. This is for high efficiency, uh, low emission biomass heating systems. In other words, this is clean, sustainable biomass, right, so sustainably harvested and so forth. We worked with a number of uh, stakeholders. We worked with a number of stakeholders uh, from uh, industry groups uh, to get a, a sense of what the cost estimates uh, were for systems like this. And once we had those cost estimates, we, we also reached out to uh, policymakers in the region uh, to get some hard data to see how well our, our cost estimates were lining up based on industry as well as past performance of systems. And so in this case, the New Hampshire Office of Energy and Planning uh, provided us some really helpful data from a rebate program of a bulk fed wood pellet uh, rebate system uh, that they piloted uh, last year. And you can see the trends coming up here in this chart. And so the uh, blue bars represent the size of the system on a kilowatt thermal basis that corresponds to the right-hand axis. Um, the, uh, the blue line, the dark blue line, represents the cost of the system, the installed cost on a dollar per kilowatt basis. And so you see a couple of trends emerging here immediately. One is that as uh, systems get smaller, costs tend to get higher on a dollar per kilowatt basis. This is to be expected, right? So essentially installers are leveraging economies of scale as, as the systems get larger. Um, however, 
there actually is a tremendous amount of variability in the cost regardless of size. And you can really see that in systems uh, in the like 20 to 30 kilowatt uh, range. Um, I mean, really, they're ranging from slightly less than $1,000 per kilowatt thermal installed to over $2,000 uh, per kilowatt thermal installed. And so I think this is kind of indicative of a, a relatively young market. And again, we're talking about low uh, emission, high efficiency systems only here, um, which haven't reached uh, a, a very large penetration in, in the New England market. Um, so anyways, in looking this all over, we, we then sort of took the next step and tried to put a, a cost estimate on our 13 kilowatt thermal system, uh, which you can see in the next slide. Uh, we assumed that a 13 kilowatt thermal system, based on industry feedback and data from the New Hampshire program, would cost in the, in the neighborhood of $21,000. Um, and this is for like a fully automatic uh, bulk fed uh, 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 biomass heating pellet system. Um, we additionally assumed that there was a fossil fuel system uh, in place as a backup heating source. Um, we didn't apply any incentives, as there were none available at the time, uh, with no financing programs in place either. So this is a 100% cash investment. Um, and then we, we sort of calculated our payback compared to a, uh, the electric heating system or the fuel oil heating system. And it came up with about seven years or 15 years, uh, respectively. Um, and in this case, biomass heating wasn't really competitive with natural gas, uh, no payback, based on, on this analysis. Um, I will point out when we looked at the commercial system, uh, the payback was much more attractive, but again, the, the costs were much lower on a, on a dollar per kilowatt thermal scale as sort of the data suggested it would be. Um, so that's how we sort of, we, we took our approach to uh, assessing a biomass heating system. On the next slide, we additionally uh, estimated uh, greenhouse gas emission reductions uh, for the same biomass uh, heating system. And this was uh, uh, analysis was based in large part on the Manimus study and DOE's ongoing regulatory development uh, for biomass uh, thermal green or biomass greenhouse gas emission reductions. In other words, this takes into account the carbon debt and dividends of, of biomass feedstock. And as I'm sure a number of you all know, uh, depending on what feedstock you use, whether it's 100% thinnings, 100% re residues, or a mix uh, of, of biomass feedstock, um, the greenhouse gas emissions will vary uh, for the system. And so the, the blue columns in this uh, chart represent the estimated emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, from biomass heating systems using different feedstocks. Uh, the tannish bar, uh, represents the fossil fuel emissions. And so the difference between those two numbers represents the greenhouse gas savings uh, for a biomass heating system in an average year. Um, and so, for example, if we took the, the middle route and assumed that we were using 50% residue and 50% thinnings, and we were offsetting an electricity heating system, uh, we would take 21 uh, tons of uh, CO2 that were emitted from the electric heating system, uh, subtract out six that were emitted from the uh, biomass heating system and come up with a, a savings of about 15 uh, tons uh, annually. Of course, that is absorbed in the forest over time, the 20-year time frame, as sort of uh, indicated by the management study. At any rate, that's um, sort of a, a more granular look at how we, we our, our approach and our methodology to this uh, report. Um, and it has started what I think is a, a really helpful conversation uh, regarding what the next step should be for renewable thermal in Massachusetts or across the nation. Um, and with that, uh, I'll sort of turn it over to Christy, who I think will be walking through uh, next steps for Massachusetts. Great. Thank you, Neil. So for those of you who haven't looked at the report, uh, Neil did a great job of condensing a pretty large comprehensive study into a few key summary slides and highlights. Um, so the Renewable Heating and Cooling Study was a, a really nice foundation for us to work from. Uh, the study clearly shows there is significant potential for, for economic development, job creation, um, and greenhouse gas emission reduction benefits. Um, and by understanding some of those key market barriers, and the state of the current uh, renewable thermal industry in Massachusetts, our businesses and key stakeholders have the opportunity to 
uh, effectively assess the market, and we as policymakers can assess how to help the industry grow. So DOER will be leading the charge in continuing to explore key issues um, and options with stakeholders to develop renewable thermal in Massachusetts and meet some of those key economic and environmental goals. And then in conjunction with the Mass Clean Energy Center, we're currently in the process of developing multiple renewable thermal programs. So without further ado, uh, in June of this year, we received approval for four uh, major programs that will utilize funds from the Mass Clean Energy Center's Renewable Energy Trust Fund and the fiscal year 2010 alternative compliance payments. Uh, the first solar hot water program is actually accepting applications um, now for residential and commercial scale projects, and we'll discuss a little bit more about that program in a couple of slides. Uh, the biomass thermal program will have three different incentive offerings, one for residential whole house automated pellet boilers, uh, one for wood stove and outdoor boiler replacements, and uh, a commercial scale offering for pellet boiler systems, um, specifically targeting municipal applications like schools and public buildings. Uh, and NAF DEP, the Department of Environmental Protection, may also have um, some funding that they're able to commit towards those biomass thermal incentive programs. Um, and I should just quickly note that the order of these programs is kind of the general order in which we expect to make program funding available. We have solar hot water on the street. We're really focusing now on biomass thermal and um, ge sorry, air source and ground source heat pumps will be um, coming up right after that. Um, and lastly, we'll be releasing a solicitation for a couple of district energy projects where we'll be specifically targeting biomass or heat pump technology applications for that. So a few of the major program goals for all of our renewable thermal programs are listed here. You'll see that the first few goals specifically are intended to tackle uh, some of the market barriers and challenges that have been identified in the renewable thermal report. Uh, so we'll be specifically working to increase public awareness and reduce upfront costs for these systems. Uh, we'll also be addressing concerns about the performance of these systems by conducting design reviews at the time of application, um, inspections when the system is complete, and potentially trainings for contractors, subcontractors, uh, and inspectors. Um, so through these programs, we hope to clarify and develop a more efficient supply chain, and of course, as was the case with the solar hot water pilot program, a major goal will be to collect and continue to collect um, project and market data on all systems um, that come through our incentive programs to help better support the industry. Um, and this will help with the last objective listed here to establish goals and levels of support for larger follow-on programs and other um, possible incentives coming down the road. So I think the solar hot water pilot programs uh, exemplify how some of the goals that we just mentioned can be achieved through a pilot incentive program. Uh, the COM solar hot water pilot program provided incentives for both residential and commercial solar hot water systems for both domestic water and space heating. The pilot program uh, ended June 30th of this year. And I think we got a great response rate, especially on the residential side. We awarded 320 uh, systems over $534,000 uh, in construction rebates. And more than half of those systems are already complete and producing water and space heating. Um, and we awarded another $350,000 to 38 commercial scale feasibility studies. Um, over 55 solar thermal installation companies actively participated in the pilot program, and we hope to, con we hope to see continued growth um, in the installation industry. And we have placed a big emphasis on performance monitoring. So we allowed residential system owners to volunteer to participate, 
and we required all commercial systems to monitor. Um, we paid for the equipment, and we're collecting a lot of good data, um, albeit with some issues in collecting that data, um, on the performance of 46 projects all over Massachusetts. Uh, we're also monitoring all of the systems that participate, participated last year in our low-income solar thermal program, uh, which was the first year of the program. We funded 16 large-scale systems on multifamily and nonprofit service facilities serving low-income residents. And we consider that program, both programs, to be a really great success. So I just want to take a quick second to thank everyone for participating in these programs. Um, you provided a lot of great feedback, uh, and I ask that you continue to help us by continuing to give that good constructive feedback for all of our programs. Um, I'll quickly review some of the results of the pilot program, and, and then I'll show how some of this feedback helps to create a new Comsolar Hot Water program. So just quickly, um, here is a uh, summary slide showing the breakdown of system use, collector type, different projects awarded by county, and the fuel type um, that the solar hot water systems were displacing. And this presentation will be posted so you can dive into this data later on. So of course, an important outcome from the solar hot water pilot program and all of your good feedback was that uh, we launched a new $10 million, four and a half year Commonwealth Solar Hot Water Program uh, just last month in July. The program will run through the end of 2016. We've set annual budgets. Uh, this year is $1.5 million budget, and that will grow each year. Uh, the program looks quite similar to the pilot programs with a few minor changes. We're offering feasibility study grants up to $5,000 to help commercial scale building owners assess uh, both the technical and economic details um, of installing a solar hot water system, and we're offering construction rebates for both residential and commercial scale installations as well. Now, this slide outlines the very basic proposed program budget for biomass thermal. Uh, Mass CEC and Mass DOER propose to offer a combination of both first-come, first-serve rebates, as well as competitively uh, solicited grants, as described in this table here. Um, we have estimated the number of projects we think we'll be able to fund with the total budget in the far right-hand column. So stepping through it for a second, um, first line, we have residential whole house uh, that's automated pellet boilers. We have a budget there for $500,000 wood and pellet stove replacements, again for space heating, $100,000. Uh, outdoor furnace swap outs and boiler replacements, $150,000. And on the commercial side, we'll have a, a pellet boiler uh, competitive solicitation um, for $1.5 million. So as part of all of these programs outside of these financial incentives, we'll be working to educate and uh, create awareness about these technologies and potentially conduct some training over the course of the pilot programs. Um, for larger projects, uh, preference will be given to those projects um, that can move sort of quickly into design and construction, uh, specifically for, for public entities. On the ground and air source heat pump side of things, um, for residential ground source, we'll have about $500,000 available. Um, we're looking at, again, sort of a first come, first serve rebate program. Um, as well as for air source, heat pumps, $400,000 available. And then on the commercial scale, specifically targeting ground source heat pumps, we'll have $1.1 million available through a competitive solicitation. And that will likely sort of come after our biomass thermal program. Lastly, funds will be used to support uh, pilot district energy systems implement, implemented um, in association with public school, public building, uh, renewable thermal projects. Thank you. Um, if these projects don't 
present the opportunity for district energy. Um, the, this pilot program may be opened up to other small um, biogas or natural gas, thermal only, um, or CHP types of applications. So that's a high level look at what Mass C and DOER have been and will continue to work on um, to support the renewable thermal industry. As I mentioned, we welcome your feedback. Um, so feel free to contact um, any of us at DOER or Mass CEC. Dwayne and my email address are listed here. And if you'd like to download the full Meister Renewable Heating and Cooling Report, you can find it on both of our um, web pages. So I think with that, we'll open it up to some questions. A bunch have come in over the course of the presentation. Uh, and I guess we'll just kind of start to fire them off. Yeah. Um, and thank you very much, everybody, for uh, sending in all these great questions. Um, there's many more than we will probably be able to uh, answer here today. So, but uh, we'll. Um, we'll do our best. Maybe first one, there's um, a couple of questions that are relating to uh, air source heat pumps. Um, and uh, uh, I think, Neil, uh, this might be one for you. The um, <coughs> question is, why don't we have more uh, information on air source heat pumps and the economics of them in the, in the study? <laughs> Yeah, that's a great question, and I think it's a, it's a really interesting and compelling technology, um, but ultimately uh, we had a lot of trouble finding um, uh, good studies to validate cost estimates uh, and performance of uh, high efficiency air source heat pumps, in particular thinking of um, inverter driven air source heat pumps. Um, so I think it's an area that I personally would love to explore further, um, and I think uh, Sort of Massachusetts has additionally has sort of indicated by this pilot program taken an interest in uh, developing as well. Um, so uh, I fully agree. Uh, worthwhile of further uh, exploration. Okay. Um, another question: How does the life cycle cost uh, of the, for the different uh, technologies uh, change at a higher natural gas price? And do we have any indication of what that level might be or how it might change? Um, another great question. Uh, we did not actually run a, a detailed analysis on uh, what the future of natural gas uh, would look like. Um, I mean, currently the levels are quite low, and I think EIA projects that they're going to uh, rise in cost at a, a very low rate as well. Um, those assumptions are detailed in the appendix. Um, but it's um, it's an interesting question, a very difficult one to answer. Um, if you want to sort of look into your crystal ball, I, I'd welcome uh, your, your input. Um, okay. Uh, was the portfolio of electric fuel sources for Massachusetts considered in the analysis of life cycle costs for each measure? Well, I, I, uh, I think the, the, the analysis, and, and Neil can correct me, uh, the analysis looked at, in terms of the uh, both the economics and the greenhouse gas emissions, it looked at the uh, at the uh, um, uh, average prices, clearing prices of electric uh, electric rates um, uh, as an economic comparison, um, as well as uh, truthfully, I'm not sure if it's the marginal or average emission rates uh, from the uh, from the ISO New England grid, most likely for the uh, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, but I suspect that would be um, um, detailed in the appendix of the report in terms of what the, the actual assumption. That, that's correct. The, the, the greenhouse gas emission from electricity is detailed in uh, the appendix, and I'm actually having a hard time remembering uh, what the ultimate source was. Um, at any rate, the cost of electricity was certainly pulled from EIA based on residential or commercial rates, um, and uh, a similar source would have been pulled for the greenhouse gas emissions. Um, this is a, a bit of a long question, but it's, a, it's an, an interesting one. Um, it's about payback times, and um, it's, is it would be more would it be more realistic uh, to consider payback times on pellet boilers uh, 
to determine the payback and cost difference for system re replacement. Um, this would be roughly $10,000 a system for automatic wood pellet over high uh, quality fuel oil. Uh, payback, payback then becomes about seven years for the thousand gal gallons a year building. Um, would that be something that we could, uh, uh, would that change the results dramatically? If I'm understanding the question correctly, I think you're suggesting that payback would be based on uh, end of life replacement, right? So either you're going to install a, a new fuel oil boiler or a new uh, biomass heating boiler. Um, if that is, if that's the assumption, uh, then absolutely payback uh, period would uh, improve dramatically uh, because you could essentially offset the cost of having to install a, a new uh, fuel oil boiler. Um, it's, it's absolutely correct. I think it's a, it's a very reasonable approach, um, but again, it depends on what your goals are. So is it to drive uh, sort of rapid increase of, of biomass heating systems? If so, are we going to depend entirely on end-of-life replacements? Uh, it's a good question. Um, and I think I've seen some analyses that suggest that you can still see rapid growth uh, with end-of-life replacements. Ultimately, in this case, we chose to go with a uh, more conservative estimate, um, but I think both approaches would be, would be valid depending on the context or the goals of the report. Okay. And then a question about um, biomass and uh, air emission regulations. Um, what is the future of biomass thermal in Massachusetts? with upcoming emissions regulations. Will there be room for systems like the sustainable, efficient systems that Neil discussed? Uh, yeah, this is uh, something that, that uh, our office, DOER, as well as the DEP, is, are uh, following quite closely. Um, and I think there's still some uh, uncertainty in terms of uh, what will come forward, particularly from the EPA, uh, on these issues. But uh, for the most part, we, as well as our, uh, I can somewhat speak for our DEP in terms of their uh, level of, of interest uh, with regard to particularly these wood pellet, um, high efficiency, uh, low emission uh, equipment in terms of the emission profiles that they represent, uh, particularly compared to uh, uh, fuel oil that it would be uh, displacing. Uh, so we do feel that there is, uh, while there is some remaining uncertainty with regard to uh, emissions, uh, that uh, the uh, technology and the emissions uh, that are uh, able to, to be met by these new technologies, and, and these will be the emissions and the technologies that we will be uh, specifying and focusing on uh, on these uh, pilot programs and policies going forward, uh, that there is a, um, a still a tremendous opportunity for these uh, uh, technologies and, and markets to develop. Um, Christine. A uh, question for you. How would you define the size of a commercial scale system? Um, I think that, that was um, relating to the solar hot water uh, program. Sure. In our incentive programs, we define commercial as basically anything non-residential greater than four units. So for our residential incentives, it's one to four units. So single family and small multifamily. Commercial is large multifamily and municipal um, and uh, anything larger than that. Okay. And then a question about wood chips. What happened to wood chips, and why are we only talking about pellets? Uh, yes, um, we are. We we are not strictly talking about pellets. Um, I will say um, that in the uh, in the pilot program that Christy mentioned or, or had the slide on with regard to the uh, proposed. Uh, program um, that uh, uh, I, I'd say there's a, a bit of an error on that. It's is for the uh, commercial scale boilers. Um, we will be looking uh, at fuel neutral um, uh, uh, technologies there in terms of including uh, both wood pellets and wood chip uh, systems, and that was in included in the MISA report as well. Looking at both of those system, both of those fuel types uh, for the commercial scale. Uh, system. So uh, do, uh, duly noted uh, that that's a uh, correction we should make in the presentation uh, for the commercial scale uh, competitive uh, grant. Again, it's all proposed at this point, but likely to move forward. Uh, that would be open to uh, not just pellet boilers, but also uh, uh, chip boilers. 
And then uh, another question about, um, or a, a wood-related question. Um, wood stoves are a well understood and relatively popular home heating technology, so what's the rationale for a subsidy program? Um, I, I'm not sure if I follow the question exactly, but uh, the issues with uh, wood, wood stoves, uh, particularly uh, you know, wood, wood stoves that, that are uh, prevalent, uh, not strictly, but largely in our rural communities, uh, is um, uh, they, they are sources of, of uh, tremendous emissions, uh, uh, air emissions, uh, particulate matter, NOx, and so forth. Uh, that is of great concern uh, to, uh, to certainly to the uh, DEP as well as to ourselves. So the idea there is that um, there is uh, a technology that's available uh, that are still wood stoves, but EPA certified wood stoves are even better than EPA wood uh, certified wood stoves that are still wood stoves. It's not replacing them with uh, much more expensive uh, for this change out program. We, we're not looking to substitute wood, uh, wood pellet boilers uh, for wood stoves. We would be uh, replacing wood stoves with uh, EPA certified or better uh, wood stove technology, uh, creating a cost-effective uh, heating system for uh, homeowners, uh, still based on um, on uh, cordwood, uh, but tremendously reducing the emissions uh, coming out of the stacks of those many uh, wood stoves around the uh, the Commonwealth, particularly in the rural communities. Okay, question for uh, for Christy. Uh, did you mention that public schools and uh, public buildings are prime candidates for commercial scale pellet boiler grants? Yes, that's correct. Schools, public buildings, and greenhouses will be big targets for those programs. Um, Maybe a little a detail is that apparently some of the numbers didn't add up correctly in slides, so we will uh, make sure to uh, to make those corrections. And thanks for uh, adding those up so quickly. Um, <laughs> um, question: Will mass safe type projects like insulation and leak reduction, uh, etc., be used or integrated? So how is it going to work with efficiency? Um, it's often said that the best returns on investment come from first doing insulation and thermal re leak reduction before adding solar hot water or plants or heat pumps. Um, energy conservation first, uh, not only so you're saving uh, uh, fuel in the future, but you also can downsize uh, the size of the uh, boiler that you have to install. Uh, so to, um, to a large extent, uh, we will be looking at um, some degree of assurance uh, that energy efficiency uh, measures are taken first uh, by these uh, grant recipients or or um, uh, um, uh, rebate and uh, uh, um, recipients uh, with these up uh, in this pilot program. Just to respond to the kind of uh, calculation error, it looks like the biomass thermal budget doesn't quite add up to $2 million. These are kind of round numbers that we're looking at, and there is the potential of adding um, some mass DEP funding to that $2 million. So this is just to kind of give an idea, and we'll come out with um, a budget that truly adds up. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, question about district energy. Um, are the district energy incentives only open to public entities? Yep. Um, quite frankly, we have not uh, really developed the district energy uh, program in detail yet, so I don't really wouldn't really have a uh, precise explanation for that. Uh, but what I will say about that is what we're looking at uh, based based on the you know relatively for district energy systems a relatively small amount of money. Uh, is to be able to use that money to really uh, um, leverage uh, a small number. I think we mentioned uh, roughly two, two or so uh, community-scale district energy systems. These would not necessarily be citywide uh, steam distribution systems, but more so uh, community-scale uh, systems that are based on hot water distribution. Again, coming from a centralized uh, biomass or ground source uh, or air source heat pump system or solar uh, thermal system. Uh, and these could be uh, community scale in the form of uh, an industrial park, 
uh, a, a, a cluster of homes, um, a, a, a downtown uh, core uh, for, a, uh, for, for a small town. Uh, so we're, we're pretty uh, open and, and uh, still uh, a bit undefined of uh, precisely what we'll be looking at uh, for that, but it's really looking at uh, sort of your more community uh, scale district energy systems. Okay. We're um, approaching 3 o'clock, so uh, this will be the last question. There's many more that we got in, <clears throat> excuse me, that we got in, and we'll try to follow up um, on, uh, on those after the webinar. And just to repeat, we will make the slides uh, available after the webinar on the website, so um, watch your inbox for more news on that. Um, but um, maybe a good one to close the webinar is about timing. When is the pilot program for the biomass heating? The, the question is, but probably applicable to uh, the broader program. When is the pilot program expected to be published? And is there going to be a comment period that must be conducted first? It's a good question. I think um, we're in the thick in the development with the biomass uh, thermal program right now. So I'm going to give the vague answer of fall time frame, um, hopefully by October. Um, and I think we, we will um, be opening up sort of certain parts of the program development process for public comment. I'm not sure in what official way we'll do so. Um, but if there are specific things that you would like to provide us feedback on, um, even without having seen some of the more detailed um, sort of proposal, feel free to email us. And with that, I think we'll end the webinar. Thanks so much to everyone who stuck with us for this hour. Um, and we will make this uh, presentation available on MassCEC and DOAR's web pages. Thanks, everyone. Have a great afternoon. <laughs>